Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Art of Transformation podcast. I'm your host, Mark Sheff, and today's conversation is a banger. I'm friends with this guy, Dan Trudzinski. We know each other from the art world. He's an incredible sculptor. He is a museum curator. He runs a program and an annual art show over at the museum, and he's got some awesome, interesting information about that. But we were talking the other day, and he told me this story about how, essentially, he got into art from a completely different path. I had no idea. He, his dad was a lawyer. He was going to be a lawyer. He was on that path. He grew up in the Midwest. There was no artists around him. He didn't have this path laid out. He didn't really know that people did this for a living. But he had this one experience that I'm going to say is borderline mystical. And when he told me this story, and he's got a lot, we're going to have him back on the podcast because he's filled with these stories. But I said, you've got to come tell this story on the podcast. People have to hear this and have to understand what exactly it was that you learned and how this experience changed your life. Because it was it was a 360 or a 180, or it was a lot of turns. Have a listen, and I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Art of Transformation podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Mark Sheff. I am so glad to be here with Dan Chudzinski. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Mark. Um, we've, we've known each other uh, a while now through the art community, through some of the events. Uh, I've been a big fan of your work. I've had the honor and pleasure of participating in the show that you curate every year. Um, can you tell us a little bit, just to sort of get into the, the conversation, can you tell us a little bit about that show and kind of what you do now? Sure. So in addition to working as a studio artist uh, who focuses primarily on uh, imaginative realism, hyper-realistic sculptures, I, my day job, where I currently am right now, is uh, serving as the director of curation and exhibitions at the Mazza Museum at the University of Finley. And the Maz Museum has the world's first and largest collection of original art from picture books. So the show that you were mentioning uh, is one that I started actually before I took this job. Uh, it's called the Enchanted Brush Exhibition. And uh, for that show, I call on my friends in the artistic community, such as yourself, uh, to create an original work of art that we then put on display. And the deal is if a work of art sells, 100% of the commission goes directly to the artist. And as far as I know, that's the only gallery show in the world that does that. Really, it's my way of saying thank you to those artists for taking time out of their busy schedules to bring their art, really to share their art with Finley, Ohio. It's it's so wonderful that you you do that. I don't know any other uh anybody else in the world who does that. I know that I, you know, we we at at the gallery that I run, we do a nice 75% commission, but I've never I've never heard a hundred, Dan. So, um, you know, in our previous conversations, one thing over the years, one thing that's really impressed me about you is just your just how deep your knowledge is of art history, of, of techniques. You've told me so many stories and, and we can't unfortunately tell all of them today yep. about um, at some point we'll have to get to Michelangelo being on the run during this painting of the Sistine Chapel. Oh, but yeah. for, for another day. What was what was fascinating to me is that you weren't always that's not what you always did. That's not, you know, when you were when you were in high school and when you went off to, to school, that wasn't that wasn't your trajectory. So I'm always fascinated to hear about these these kind of right turns in people's lives. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it to you. And I know that I've prefaced this already in the intro and the people are it excited to hear this story. But I, I wanna yep. hear this story, almost this magical story of, okay. of transformation from and tell us kind of like a little bit, where, where were you when you were going into this story? Like, what was your, what did you think your reality was looking like for the future? Okay. Well, I can tell you that from an early age, I knew I always wanted to be an artist and I loved art, but I grew up in Fremont, Ohio, a small town of 16,000 people. I didn't know any professional artists really until I was out of college. And when I say professional, I'm talking about people who make most of their income working as an artist. So. I didn't have any artists in the family. My family was always supportive, but at the time I was in college, my junior year of college, I was studying art, uh, but I was mostly studying history in preparation for law school. And right. I had always lawyer, respected- is that, is that right? What's that? Your dad was a lawyer, if I'm not mistaken. He still is. He okay. still is a lawyer. <laughs> and, and I always saw the enthusiasm he had for his work. 
And then growing up in a small town, you know, people would pull me aside and they would tell me stories about things my dad did for them when they couldn't afford to hire him. You know, he would he would work out a deal where they could pay him in crops. And uh, I thought that's pretty admirable. And I could see how he's helping people. And, you know, I still have a great relationship with my parents. And I thought it wouldn't be a bad thing to, to go in to that line of work. Now, I had thought at the time I'm probably going to be doing some sort of law related to museums and with art. Um, but it wasn't on my trajectory that I would ever become a director of curation. Uh, and at the time, I didn't know a path to become a professional artist. Mm. Uh, but that all changed spring break of my junior year. So there were only a few weeks left in the semester. And I got a call from a childhood friend of mine named Madeline Coons. Uh, we had grown up together and she was studying at the American University of Rome. So she had invited myself and another friend um, to go out to Rome and visit her. Not your typical spring break. We were headed to the Vatican instead of the beach. But for me, I was... I was excited to be there because one of, uh, well, I should say most of my artistic heroes from the Renaissance are represented in that collection. Because you were a big, as you said, you were like a big history buff and you knew, well, you studied, you were studying it in school, if I'm not mistaken. So here's an opportunity for you to step into that. But where, where did you, as you, like, I'm just sort of curious, like you went on this trip, you were looking to to have a career as a as a lawyer following the footsteps of your dad. I mean, the other thing that I heard you say, which I think I, I don't know if I caught this last time we talked, is that your dad also gave back. Like he he made deals with people. He used his you know mm -hmm. his position in whatever way he could to help people in the ways that he thought they needed. And as we discussed, like you have this show, and it's the only show that I know of that you know you give yeah. up to all the money. So it sounds like even in in your own way, that was a huge influence. Uh, yeah, I have to say that somewhere along the line, I realized that money wasn't a great motivator for me. Uh, you know, it's important to be able to pay the bills and uh, to be able to support people. But I was more interested in, you know, what you could do with the skill set at hand. And that I remember going on that trip when Madeline first invited me to come to Rome. I'm almost embarrassed to say this now because Rome was so transformational. Rome wasn't even on my radar at that point in my life of a place to go visit. And I really thought about it. Like, are we really buying tickets? And I remember we bought, we bought our tickets like way before in November, thought, just to kind of force ourselves to commit to going to visit her. So mm -hmm. I had never traveled that far away from home. And we get to Rome and I was going to spend 10 days there. And it turned out to be 10 days that changed the trajectory of my life. And what happened was Madeline at the time was, um, she was dating a Swiss guard. The Swiss guard are the Pope's bodyguards. Hold on, the your elite. friend Madeline is living in Rome. No. Yeah, she, she's, she's living in Rome. She's studying at the American University okay. of That's Rome. That's how she's dating somebody who, who's working. Yes. Okay. So but she, she eventually. Before, before yeah. you get into this, so Rome wasn't on your radar as, as an art historian or, you know, as somebody who is studying this, what, what, what was on your radar? Like, where did you think that you'd rather have been? Uh, well, I always had an affinity for the Renaissance artists, which Florence is really where that happened, which is not far from Rome. Sure. It's a completely different culture. You know, uh, Florence was this small republic at that time, and the Medici were really running things behind the scenes, the art patrons. And then Rome was, you know, the power, this big empire, the, the head of the the papal states and the Vatican. So the artists worked back and forth, but, um, and I knew like at some point I'd get over there. I just wasn't thinking that soon in my life. So we went to Rome and she said, is there anything you really want to see at the Vatican museums? Which by the way, uh, the Vatican museums at that time, um, they said that you know, less than 1% of their holdings is on display. And they said, if you were to spend a minute in front of everything we have out, it would take you 12 years to go through. So just know that before you go in. So I said, all right, I want to see the Sistine Chapel is number one. And I want to see Michelangelo's Pieta. So Michelangelo 
always was and still is a huge influence on me. And I have to say that I knew that name first as a, as a Ninja Turtle, as a reptile, long before <laughs> I knew him as a Renaissance master. I think, most, I think most of us were introduced to art history through the Ninja Turtles, probably. <laughs> yeah. And I still have a passion for the Renaissance artists and the Ninja Turtles, so that <laughs> hasn't changed. So what happened that day was we scheduled a tour for a time when the public wasn't going to be really there yet. So it was in the middle of the week, very like first thing in the morning. And we, they told me before we walked in, now this is going to be hard for you because we're going to run to the chapel first, which is the last thing that you see. So the, we're going to go there so that you have the most time before the crowds come in. And then you're going to work your way backwards through the museum. And I do remember being dragged literally through the Vatican because I would keep stopping in front of these works I'd wanted to see my whole life. And they would just grab, like yank me by the arm or by the collar around the corner. So it was a lot of buildup. And I remember walking down this spiral, like kind of this back spiral staircase. And I just stopped. And they looked back and they said, what's, what's going on? And I said, it's on the other side of this wall, isn't it? And they said, uh, yeah, how do you know that? Have you been here? And I said, I just know. Like, I know it's right there. And we came down around the steps. And I remember uh, letting, the, my friends were there with me, but letting the two of them walk in first. And I walked in last. And I took one glimpse. And I can tell you the exact, like, detail that I saw. And I like kind of gasped like I just jumped into cold water and I remember like tearing up immediately but uh, I wasn't ready for that response I'd never had art hit me quite that hard and I, I literally stepped out of the room so I, I don't even know if I had both feet in the room when that happened and I thought at the time maybe I'm having a panic attack but I've never in my life then or now had a panic attack so I couldn't describe it I would later learn that that is something called a synthetic response, and it happens in people that can taste, um, they can taste color, uh, or they can hear a smell. So it's kind of like your senses go into overload. Yes, and in that room, is I think the name. Yeah, I was I was completely immersed in that level of art you know the, the floor the walls everything is covered so it was like there was no visual escape from it until i walked out into the hallway and i remember just kind of catching my breath and fortunately i don't if any of them realized that happened to me they didn't say anything and i just walked in and the next 30 minutes went by and it might as well have been seconds but it was so much better than i could anticipate and we could kind of tell that crowds were going to be coming. You could hear them. And so they said, well, you know, do you want to see the School of Athens? And I just started walking. And I knew where it was. I don't know to this day how I knew, but I just walked out. And the School of Athens were painted by Raphael. Uh, that's a painting done in the Papal Apartments by Raphael when he was 19. It was his first major Vatican commission. And I'm standing alone in front of it. I mean, I was so close. I could have touched it. I could have licked it. There was nobody in the room. I wasn't about to do those things, but I do remember getting like so close. My nose was about two inches off of it. And for the, when you see it that close, you can see little corrections that he made when he was painting little imperfections that never show up in even a high res photo. Mm. And it dawned on me in that moment for the first time in my life that this, he was real. And if he mm. was real, he was painting this while Michelangelo's next door. He was real. And, he even painted Michelangelo in it as an afterthought. Uh, and then I was realizing at the time, I was uh, probably 20, and I thought Raphael was my age when he painted this. And I'm thinking, gosh, he did this without photography. He did it without, he had to make, make his own paints, make his own brushes. And then I'm thinking, like, he didn't have a digital, like an opaque projector. Right. He didn't even have artificial light. And I remember when I got to the point when I realized he painted that in natural lighting, I thought, what is my excuse? Like, if he did this 500 years ago, and I couldn't, I couldn't come up with an excuse. And I knew right then that I wasn't going to be a lawyer. 
that I wanted to do whatever had just happened to me. I wanted to create things that were going to do that to other people. Mm. And I might only get the chance to make one in my life, but it still seemed like a that was the path I wanted. So while we're in that room, the Swiss Guard... Let me just, let me just say there, you know, that's, so, yeah. that's really interesting. I feel like this has come up a lot. I was talking with um, some clients this week and some other, other coaches. And actually, I was talking to another coach about some of the training, you know, that they, that they might want to do. And we were talking about, there's all kinds of, you know, there's all kinds of different trainings that you can take different, you know, if you want to go into like leadership coaching, team coaching, NLP, sure. Enneagram, all this stuff. And she was trying to figure out kind of which one to do. And what it came down to was like, which are, which are the experiences you've had that have really touched you and mm -hmm. made a difference for you? Cause that's, that's a pretty good indicator of, maybe the way that you'll that you the skill that you'll want to learn so that you can provide that experience for other people and and th there's, a, there's a thread there in your story around you having this deep and meaningful and quite frankly kind of mystical experience mm -hmm. and realizing in the same way that your dad was able to take the thing that he loved doing and provide a service for people make it accessible for people give people you know whatever experience maybe you know maybe he had a a great lawyer mm -hmm. when he was a kid or something, you know, but you've taken now this experience and you've decided in this moment, I'm going to dedicate my life to this. And, and as we said before, you're starting to provide as a, I, I'm sure you do this all the time as the curator of the museum, but certainly the curator of this show, providing an experience for people to both create in this way, to experience art in this way. I think there's a beautiful little, little message there about this thread of you kind of always tuning into some way that you can uh, build a skill around your passion in order to be of service. Yes. And I think the, from that day, the challenge became, okay, how can you make this vision a reality? And mm. I kept reminding myself through all of that, you know, what, what is your excuse? And then my mantra really became make art, not excuses. So anytime I would try to, like, oh, it's going to be hard. Make art. Like, you're not dealing with the bubonic plague. You're not dealing with an invading army that is sacking Rome while you're trying to paint. Make art. And so I got to see one other. Well, I saw a lot of things that day that inspired me, but there was another one that really kind of jarred me. And it was um, they got out Bernini's maquettes. And Bernini was like the greatest sculptor of the Baroque era, without question. And they had his clay models that he did for the big monuments. And his fingerprints were visible in the oil play. And so to me, that was a revelation. That was the first time I, I truly realized these guys weren't these gods with mystical powers. They were human. And he had actually used the clay that he got from the river outside. You know, it was, it was nothing special. Uh, he just went down there and he turned literal dirt into this thing that became a masterpiece. It just cut out there, so I paused <laughs> just to make sure. Oh. Okay, wait, let me mark, I'll mark the time. Yeah. There's like a 17. Okay, and I'll just say so that if they do the transcript that we're gonna edit this part right here. Um, and I yeah. can continue if you need. No, I, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll edit this part, but Again, I just, I, I love hearing this because I, I had a very similar, exp I mean, not, not, not in any way this, this epic, but I, I feel like I've heard this also from, I just read maybe Alan Douglas, someone talking about seeing another artist's work and realizing, and I had this realization too, where like, you know, I grew up looking at art, studying art history and, you know, high school and other, and other times, and just looking at all this art on, you know, on books that I loved, mm -hmm. that I loved reading. I looked at more of the books than I ever read, and I read a lot of the books, but only, you know, almost 30 years later, you know, 25, 30 years later, meeting some of the people, you know, in person and seeing their work in person going, oh, oh, people actually, people, so people do this, like, this is a thing right. that you could, this is a thing that you could do, <laughs> you know, and, and having that, you know, obviously, you're not meeting Michelangelo and, you know, you know Donatello and Raphael, um, and the other turtles, but you, you're actually experiencing their work in a way that makes them, that makes you realize that, like you said, make, make art, not excuses. Like you, you're 20 years old. He was 19 years old. 
you also have all of these tools now and photography and uh, projectors and other ways of streamlining this work. So mm -hmm. I, I, would, I do want you to continue your story. I think we left off sure. with um, a guy collecting mud down by the river and making timeless sculptures. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I saw the Bernini sculptures and realized that he had made that out of mud that he gathered uh, from the banks of the Tiber. And that, to me, that was enough that day. And I would that was one of the first days of the trip. So the rest of the trip, I still look back on the, that trip now, which was back in 2006, and I, I talked to my friends that were on it. And that actually, that period changed the trajectory of all three of our lives. And we look back on that quite a bit. But I remember coming home. Mm. And it was kind of like leaving you know, the honeymoon's over, you're leaving Rome, now you're back to life, and how are you going to apply what you just learned? How are you going to bring that to Ohio? And my mom picked me up at the Detroit airport pretty late, right? so I caught a red-eye flight back, and I remember it was like two in the morning, and we had about an hour and a half drive to get home. So after that long flight and that traveling, I was not as talkative as I would typically be. And she said, uh, we got on the highway. And she says, so how was it? <laughs> and I said, it, it was life changing. And that was about all. And she, she said, is that it? And I said, well, I'm not going to be a lawyer. And there's this pause. Felt like forever. And then she starts laughing. And I have to say, at that moment, it felt a little bit like somebody laughing at a funeral. So I misread it. And I'm thinking, oh, gosh, you know, she's laughing because the thought of me being anything other than a lawyer must be so ridiculous to her. And she says, your father always knew you were never going to be an attorney. <laughs> and I said, what? And they had never, in fairness, they never pressured me. They never said, you're going to do this. But they said, if you are going to study art, we think you need to have a backup. And history, you know, is a logical precursor to, to law school. So sure. yeah. that's why I was doing it. Now, side note, I just learned uh, recently USA uh, or U.S. News put out a report that the of the top 10 um, least profitable companies, college degrees. And I am proud to say that I have two in the top five, uh, one being a fine arts major, one being a historian. And I can tell you, I've had multiple good careers at both. So it really, it just depends on what you do with the training. But my training made me uniquely adapted to take on the roles that I would later in life as both a college professor and as a museum curator, uh, as well as a professional artist. So that conversation with my mom I remember her saying after that moment she said you know your dad he knew you wouldn't be a lawyer he said you would be drawing people in court when you were supposed to be listening to their testimony and I, I said you know he's not wrong I, that's probably exactly what I would have been doing and she said but you know we don't we're not artists we don't know any artists and I said I know and she said we support you but this path is going to be a lot harder for you than if you had just been a lawyer. And, you know, it's kind of funny because I knew how hard it was to, to become a lawyer from what my dad would tell me about passing the bar. And I know the way he put himself through school. And um, that was the first time I had anybody kind of put it in those terms that like it might be easier for you to become a lawyer than an artist. And they, mm. I don't think they were wrong. And the next thing she said stuck with me because my mom was more direct than she can sometimes be. And she just said, you know, we didn't raise a starving artist. And that was her way of saying, like, if you're going to chase this, you better do it because we'll support it. But you're, it's, you're going to have to find the path. And I will say that the, the, the biggest lesson I can condense all of that down into is that the path to becoming an artist, and I would venture to say anything any niche profession or anything you want to be successful, in, uh, it's never a linear path. Yeah. And, and I mean, we don't, unfortunately we don't have time to like go, I, we will have to have you come back and sort of talk because I want to hear more about that, that path. That's like a whole other, that's a whole other episode. So I'm definitely going to, sure. I'm definitely gonna have you back for a round two. Okay. All um, right. That's fair. But, 
what what I what I also love about this story, and the reason I wanted you to come tell this story, is that it's not is that it's not linear, and and that also it was you know it was unexpected. I, I'm I'm curious if there if there maybe you have an answer for this, maybe you don't, but I am curious about kind of who you were in in that moment, you know, to have the presence of mind to say, I'm going to take this other path. I think a lot of people might still feel a lot of pressure or resignation coming home and saying, well, I'll find a way to, you know, maybe do some more art than I thought I was going to do, but not certainly, you know, as a, as a career, you know, if there's, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a lesson, but what, what's the mindset that you kind of, ha- that, you, that you had then that allowed yeah. you to make that really, really big decision? I mean, you make it sound kind of like, well, I guess I'm not going to be a lawyer. Like, and, and you know, and, well, your mom, and your mom said you're going to have to work for it. And okay, yeah. still, there was a point there where you just made that decision. If you were to ask, and this is, this is to kind of illustrate my mindset, but if you were to ask, um, like, what's, what, if I can only be described in one word in my obituary, <laughs> what would it be? It would be artist. So I think it was that I could not, after that day, could not envision myself doing anything else. And it dawned on me. I think I deep down knew I was always going to try to be an artist. I just didn't see a path. And that day I thought I need to make one because um, why not? And I knew the stories of, of all of these guys, you know, Michelangelo, Raphael, like Raphael came he his father was a court painter at Urbino, so he was literally groomed to be in a position to get that commission. But Michelangelo wasn't. Um, you know, he was nursed by a literally nursed by a stonemason's wife because his mother died when he was very young, and stonemasons were looked at as a very lowly profession. Um, da Vinci was a bastard. Uh, he was born out of wedlock, and he showed aptitude early, but that wasn't um, the plan for him to become neither of those guys. They both had to to really fight for it, literally fight. Michelangelo got his nose broken over it when he was 12 years old, um, and his nose was flat for the rest of his life. So that was a a debate about, uh, that was during an art critique. Uh, (laughs) Was it real? Okay, so so, people who are complaining about their art critiques now can just take a seat. (laughs) Yeah, he did ask for it, though. He had it coming, but... uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what what I saw, what I realized, I think, in that day was the shift in mindset was that art is no longer a hobby for you. That's not going to be good enough. It is a lifestyle. So how do you build the rest of your life around the pursuit of this thing? And and an example, I knew I had to get back to Italy. I was back six months later. And shortly after that, I went back and I did an apprenticeship as a marble carver in the same village where Michelangelo was trained. And I do remember them asking me, you know, they were showing me at the time the modern equipment. And in and, and that point, they had the very early, like, CNC machines that could actually carve something based on a model. And I had no interest in learning it that way. And I remember going into a museum and pointing to, they were showing me the tools that Michelangelo would have used. And I actually commissioned a local blacksmith to create, recreate those tools for me. He did it in one night. And then I used those tools. And one of the ways I asked them to train me was by using natural light only. And they said, nobody has asked us to do that ever. And I said, I'm asking you, you know, you guys are the best. And I think there was this this bond immediately because they saw that I was all in. And, you know, working in marble and working around a marble quarry is very dangerous. It's not glamorous. I mean, it might seem glamorous, but it's it's rough work. But I know well, I needed a to be in that place. Maybe not glamorous, but, but a so romantic that, idea. What's that? Well, I said maybe maybe not glamorous, but there's certainly this romantic idea. Like we have sure. like TV shows now, you know, where every you know everything you know, uh, like we've, everyone on the CW is like very. They, they've all had showers and they're you know they're bathed and they're doing their <laughs> blacksmithing or whatever the hell. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's obviously not how it was. And you know, actually, this ties into something you said earlier, and I I feel like. There's maybe an expansion on this phrase, but you said you realized, you know, seeing that these guys were doing stuff at 19, 20 years old to to make art, not excuses. I feel like you're taking that now into every step of this transform transformation into 
the the artist, the curator that, that you are now that at every stage, and, and again, we're going to have to have you back on the show to talk more about this. Sure. But what I see is that you, you know, there's a, th there's a thing you want to learn. You want to learn it deeply. Like you said, you're all in. So you make that, whether, whether the art is the physical art or the art of the, you know, the business or the jobs that you're trying to get, you make, you just make that and, and stop making excuses. I, I guess there was a pause there. You cut, you cut out for about 30 seconds. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, another sorry. pause. This one's going to be fun to edit for those guys. Sorry, yeah. you guys, about, about the, uh, the editing. Um, what I did say, and they'll have to figure out how to, how to seam this together, is, is this idea of just making your, making your work and not making excuses, whether it's the art or learning the skill not trying to cut corners and say, okay, oh, there's this fast tool. Let me learn this fast tool. And we don't even have to start on AI right now. But, but just saying, I want to learn how to make these things so that you understand it as deeply as possible. Yeah, it's about getting out of your comfort zone. And I can think of uh, fewer, better ways to do it than moving to a place where you don't speak the language at all. You don't speak <laughs> the dialect. And they don't really love outsiders. And that, and they are very particular about their art because the best artists in the world, at least the best marble carvers, were all living in that neighborhood. Um, so there were definitely dues that had to be paid when I showed up, and uh, I, you know, I earned a lot of respect by being the first and last person in the studio every day. And they just saw that they would give me a book, they'd recommend a book, and I would read it that night because. You know, I couldn't go out and socialize. I didn't know a lot of people. So <laughs> and you didn't speak I was, the language. I, and I got better at it. I could speak it at a conversational level by the time I left. But even so, a lot of my knowledge of Italian was these obscure sculpting terms that <laughs> outside of that circle, the average Italian is not going to understand what you're talking about. Uh, but I have to say that um, I got to know Michelangelo so well that at one point I knew what was going on in his life 500 years before better than I knew what was happening with any of my friends um, or in, in some cases, even my immediate family. Now that's not for everybody. And the internet was very restricted back then. We couldn't get that. We couldn't do like a zoom call. So it's better now. Uh, but at that point in my life, that was a very good way to either figure out, that I had what it took or not. And, and I'm pretty stubborn um, about getting better as an artist. It's, it's, I had this experience, uh, actually, we, weirdly, I've had this experience a few times, not, not just with art, but actually with my computer science studies, where uh, there, was a, there was an initial experience that was designed to be very intense, mm -hmm. that was designed to be a bit of a litmus test and a crucible to, you know a litmus test inside of a crucible to say okay i'm, I'm gonna actually go for like the really hard experience here to really see because you know it's not going to be extremely hard all the time but it's going to be hard over time it's going right. to be sustained effort over time i yep. want to see that i can do this intense burst of an experience as a way of really testing my metal but also telling myself a new story that i can do this you know, that I'm capable of doing this. Maybe, you know, maybe you were the best sculptor in the room, maybe not, but you got through the experience in a way that told you, okay, I, if I can, you know, if I can handle this, I think about this also in terms of parenting and, and yeah. stay, stay with me here. But if you can get through, and I can tell you from experience twice, if you can get through that first year of a newborn and yeah. stay married, I, I think you can probably do anything. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I'm not on that journey yet, but someday. Um, I, I, unfortunately, I, I, we're going to have to have you back on the show because there's so many, there's sure. so many stories and so many transformative moments. And I know, I know that you teach, and obviously, and then you've been doing this for many years, so you're very good at it. Um, thank you. But if somebody, uh, if somebody were, thank you for first of all for coming and sharing your wisdom. I, I, I already know kind of what I want to talk about in terms of what this episode is about. Is I this just a beautiful idea of making art and not making excuses. And it could be making art. It could be making, you know, your, you know, it could be creating your next project, your next business. I mean, it, it's so globally applicable. Um, but if people do want to find out more about, 
uh, how to, you know, about both, both about your work, about the Enchanted sure. Brush exhibition. Where's a good place that people can kind of go and find all of these things? So there's there's two places I would recommend. Um, uh, Dan Shinsky on Instagram. It's really the only uh, social media that I'm super active on at and, the moment. And we'll, just and, for people to know, like we'll put these links in the show notes. I know that Chudzinski yeah. is maybe not for everybody yeah. like to, to, to spell, but we'll put it in the show notes so you can have you'll have a link to it. And then the other place I would just do you can do a Google search, and I've done a lot of interviews for the museum uh, and for here. So. Um, despite my best efforts, I'm pretty easy to find on, <laughs> online. Amazing. Yeah, well, I encourage everyone to go definitely check out your work and also the work that you spent so much time supporting both at the museum and the exhibition, which is so great. And I know, obviously, know a lot of the artists there. I've had a pleasure of participating there. Uh, and, and don't forget that you can buy the artist's work there and support the artists. And you know that they get 100% of the commission, which is just really, I, I don't know. I don't think I actually knew that, Dan. And that's amazing. So yeah, well, that's, I'm happy to do it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming. Like I said, we're, we're going to have you back and um, yeah, that's it. Thanks very much. All right. Pleasure to be here. Okay. Was I right? Make art, not excuses. If you just take one thing away from that, that podcast, and I don't care if it's art, you know, maybe you're a creative, maybe you're trying to figure out parenting or relationships, make whatever it is that you want to make, make your vision and stop making excuses. I think that's a beautiful message. And I have to tell you, Dan and I talked for probably another hour after that podcast. We're going to have him back on because he's got so many of these just fascinating stories. And all of them, all of them are these kind of like 30 degree, 180 right turns. Life is filled with these things. And when you're someone like Dan, who's really just willing to see opportunity and explore those opportunities, transformation happens. So as always, please like, subscribe, and do share these with your friends. If you have someone who would love to hear this story, that's the best way that you can support this podcast. So thanks for listening, and I will see you next time. <music>